Our ocean seems boundless, but since the Industrial Revolution, mass combustion of fossil fuels has been pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Much of the atmospheric CO2 has been absorbed by the ocean, causing changes to the seemingly fathomless water body. If this pattern continues, what will happen to our ocean? How will it affect our marine ecosystem? These questions have been fascinating Dr. Celia Shunter. We see here is the pH scale from zero, very acidic, to seven, neutral. And here we are a little bit above neutral. This is usually what we drink. I'm going to imitate ocean acidification by using the CO2 in my lungs, and I'm going to blow it into the water, and then we see how the pH scale goes down. This is already a um, kind of a not so great level for marine organisms, like 7.7 .7 is what we would expect by the end of the century. So in the end, this is already a very low pH, and you'll see it keeps going down. So the more it absorbs the CO2, the more the pH is reduced. Our water was at pH level of 8 before, and just blowing a little bit into the water, we immediately came to 7.7, .7, which is already where fish change their behavior. And if we go blow a little bit more, and we go further down the pH scale, it's even that shelled organisms can't build their shell anymore because it becomes too acidic. So we really need very little CO2 to affect the water pH and therefore affect the marine organisms. Ocean acidification is a part of climate change because uh, what we do as humans is we put CO2 out in the atmosphere right now. The CO2 goes into the atmosphere and actually a lot of it, up to you know, 25, 30%, is taken up by the oceans. And um, what happens then though is a chemical reaction with the water and it ends up meaning that within the water column, the pH reduces. And so what happens to many organisms is they either can't grow well, for example, shelled organisms that lose their shell or the shell becomes very thin. For fish, some people have referred to it as a bit drunk or a bit sleepy <laughs> um, because the, of the CO2 actually affects their brains. In the marine world, uh, many organisms uh, communicate with each other by sending cues. So if there's a predator and the predator comes and bites me, then I would send out a signal called a chemical alarm cue to all the other fish around and say, warning, warning, there's a big predator coming. And so then they can go and hide in the reefs or in, in holes or crevices, behind stones, etc. So it's a very important mechanism to communicate and to survive. And so what happens when ocean acidification is strong, then basically there is no real reaction to this chemical alarm cue anymore, which then means is that they can be eaten by the predators. So what we are doing um, is we study a lot um, across different ecosystems and we look at many different fish species so that we can understand um, which species will be able to deal with ocean acidification and which species might not be so well off. To understand how organisms survive under ocean acidification, Dr. Shunta went to Papua New Guinea to conduct research. Their seabed has many underwater volcanoes that release carbon dioxide continuously, which can be used to model future ocean acidification scenarios. And so when we went to Papua New Guinea, it was one of the first studies where we were able to collect several different uh, reef fish, coral reef fish species. And so we can compare and basically to determine who are the winners and who are the losers, right, with, with this ocean acidification. We're able to do this in Papua New Guinea and collect in the wild uh, many different species. And so we could compare across different coral reef fishes to understand which ones will do well and which ones are going to struggle more. And therefore we can suggest better management of certain species and to protect them and not lose them out of the ecosystem. Of course, Papua New Guinea is far away, right? So you think that uh, maybe the research that um, was done there isn't really relevant to Hong Kong, but that's not quite true because it allows us to understand um, what 
fish will how fish will respond um, to ocean acidification. And the ocean acidification is happening here in Hong Kong as well. And we find similar fish species here. So we can now look at these results or take these results and look at uh, the Hong Kong communities to understand which fish will be struggling more in the future once the pH goes more and more down uh, over the next decades. And, uh, but apart from our experiments and our field work, um, in my lab, uh, we use a lot of molecular and also computational tools. So after we do these experiments, we then take out different tissues of these fish and then we analyze them. In the end, what we call sequencing, and then we look at sequences on the computer, which is uh, sometimes, you know, tens of terabytes of data of our genetic letters, which are A, T, C, and G, basically do a puzzle, almost. Uh, we get to find the important key parts um, uh, in that uh, kind of messy puzzle, <laughs> and that will help us explain why these organisms can deal uh, with um, a change in the environment. Apart from ocean acidification, there are many topics surrounding Hong Kong's marine ecology that have yet to be explored. Here, Dr. Shinta and her team are going out to the sea to study a cryptic group of fish that has never been studied before. They brought their full set of scuba gear as these fish dwell at the bottom of the sea. Over the last 10 years, maybe five years, research has shown that uh, the fish ecosystem um, so the trophic level from, you know, small fish to very big fish, the small fish are key to keeping the whole food web working. And so in Hong Kong, in fact, we don't know much about what we call cryptobenthic fishes. So these are these little fishes because they are hidden, so they're crypto, and uh, benthic because they sit on the, the bottom floor. And uh, so these cryptobenthic fishes, um, we are now studying them in Hong Kong. So we're going across different locations. Then we are currently now collecting them to see what species we find and, um, and how they live and what compositions we have in the different areas of Hong Kong that could support the uh, Hong Kong fish ecosystem. Ready for the net? Grouped two by two, the research team dive down to the seafloor in search of cryptobenthic fish species. Our colleagues are diving now. Once they reach the seafloor, they have a long transect. It's like a line that they place so they can follow the line. And they will place uh, the net that we made. I connected a chain along the net so that it doesn't float away. And then we covered the net with a plastic cover uh, because in this way it's easier to keep the solution that we're using to put the fish asleep to keep it on the seafloor so that it doesn't just disperse in the water. So the solution is to make the fish uh, a bit dizzy and then to collect them with the net. So then once they do the first quadrat, they will move five meters along the transect and then they place the second quadrat and then they do it three times each pair. After the diver team collected the fish from the sea, they will be handed over to Maxine for immediate treatment and record. We are going to actually cut the fin of the fish and then we place the small fin inside of a container with ethanol uh, to preserve it because then we are going to extract DNA from the fin to then identify the species from the DNA. It's easier in this way because sometimes these fish, they all look similar, but the DNA will actually tell us what species is it. So because they are uh, fish that sit on the ground, they have this uh, particular structure that's kind of at their chest, if you want, um, so that they can sit easily on the ground. So that's an adaptation to living on the sand. And it kind of serves as a... Um, kind of like a hold, <laughs> helps them um, stay on the rock or the sand. 
it's actually surprisingly good. <laughs> Visibility isn't great, but we only need to see something about 10 centimeters away. And uh, there's so many little fish all over. <laughs> when we go to the site, they're actually very curious. They come out, they come look at you. And uh, so we try to you know, catch them underneath our net. After finishing with sampling at the Gold Coast in Tun Mun, the team heads to northern Lantau Island for another sampling session for the cryptobenthic fish community. The project wants to cover the western side of Hong Kong. The western side is not very well studied in the sense that usually divers always go to the eastern waters because the visibility is higher. So there are lots of divers who go there and we already have lots of photos but we don't have as much information from the Western waters. Having completed their surveys in the wild, more lab work awaits the research team. After organizing the sample tissues, they still have to conduct a series of analyses to identify the fish species. Today's fieldwork was very successful because we collected so many fish, over 40 fish, and they all looked quite different. So they probably belong to different species. And uh, on Friday, we're actually going to take photos of them and we're going to ask different taxonomists to identify species because they're expert on specific type of fish. Super time. So now, like, we only focus on the heads and expectancy. The neutral. Sometimes they have the issues better around the, the chains. Very good. Ah, oh, that's a neutral. See? Oh, yeah. That's, that's the one we want to see. This family of fish relies on its nostrils and other small morphological details for species identification. How about the thing on the other side? I cut it. Ah, okay. You see these protrusions from its nostrils. Occasionally, we rely on that for identification. And now we look it up a bit so we can take a picture of the whole bottom. Take picture is much easier to do. Mm -hmm. And when you put the formula in, you can see the drops, too many drops of formula in, it's fixed already. Mm, yeah. yeah. Oh, so beautiful. Cryptobenthic fish includes a diverse array of species. Their nostrils and the shape of their fins are important diagnostic features. Their morphological details will be sent to overseas experts for species identification. And we have other projects where we work with groupers, in particular the hybrid grouper. So we call that here the Saba grouper, which is probably something you see most days when you go to the fish market. But in fact, this is a man-made fish. And it's not a natural fish that exists out in the wild. Saba grouper is a hybrid produced by crossing grouper with tiger grouper. It's an artificially produced hybrid. Up until now, we haven't seen any naturally occurring hybrids in the wild. They grow very quickly, and rearing them is very easy. That's why it is a very popular species in the aquaculture industry. Recently, Mercy Release is gaining popularity in Hong Kong. These activities are organized by religious groups. They usually purchase the fish from wholesale or wet markets and then release them at nearby piers or out at the sea by boat. Why is it a concern? This is because Saba grouper is a generalist predator that eats all kinds of organisms. It might harm our local marine ecosystem. Unfortunately, its potential impacts have never been studied before. This is why we're trying to address this issue with our research and hopefully answer some questions.
To gather specimens, I go hunt for Saba groupers in Hong Kong's waters and ask around friends who go fishing. After gathering the specimens, I would dissect them to extract all tissues found in their guts to conduct DNA extraction and investigate their potential prey. Crab is the most common prey item. For example, this crab is quite intact, meaning that it was freshly ingested. Fish can be found in the guts too. The feeding habits of Saba groupers can be quite extreme and weird. They might wander around extremely shallow waters or even approach humans for food. These are typical behaviors of fish that were mercy released from fish farms. This could indicate that they have yet to adapt to Hong Kong's natural environment, but this doesn't mean that they are harmless to our local ecosystem. According to our research, they consume a large variety of organisms, including different fish species, crabs and many cephalopods. This implies that they can be quite destructive to our local marine community. If the population of Saba grouper expands, so will their negative impacts. Of course, we would recommend against mercy releases as it is a non-native species and an artificial hybrid. Releasing them to local waters will not be ideal. This is why I recommend removing them from the natural environments in Hong Kong. This reddish-orange spotted fish is called Hong Kong grouper. Although it is named after Hong Kong, it is an endangered species and is extremely rare in our natural habitat. Hong Kong grouper was once very common and widespread in Hong Kong in the 1960s. Unfortunately, overfishing has driven them to the brink of extinction since the 1990s. They are now very rare in local waters or in fish markets. This is a regrettable situation as it is such an iconic fish in Hong Kong. This is why we're investigating the best way to conserve and protect the species. Previous research on Hong Kong grouper relied on dive searches or market research. However, both methods are rather inefficient as this species is too rare. Besides, these two methods cannot inform us of their abundance, frequency of their occurrence, or their habitat distribution. This is why we're trying a novel approach called environmental DNA or eDNA. Basically, we visit potential habitats to collect seawater samples and examine whether they contain traces of Hong Kong grouper DNA. The presence and amount of DNA will inform us of the presence and abundance of this species. The setup for environmental DNA extraction is simple. This tube pumps up seawater, which will then pass through two filters and both of these filters have their own uses. The first filter removes impurities. The impurities include things such as rubbish, mackerel algae, zooplankton, etc. The second filter collects all environmental DNA, which might include those of our target species, the Hong Kong grouper. Yes, this is found in the second white filter. We just finished obtaining the eDNA, which are all trapped in this filter. As eDNA is very fragile and unstable, we have to process them as soon as possible to bring them safely back to our lab for further analyses. This is a DNA buffer, which is added to the filter to preserve the eDNA. This step must be done immediately on the boat. Uh, so 
After extracting the environmental DNA, we will use droplet digital PCR technology to quickly quantify the amount of Hong Kong grouper DNA in the sample. This will be used to estimate the number of Hong Kong groupers in any given locale. Or perhaps there is none at all. Today, we're extracting environmental DNA at six different sites. These include several marine parks. There are around 14 sites in Hong Kong. We will survey around some islands, all the way from Sai Kung to Kuo Chow and Po Toi Islands, and sample the environmental DNA. Arthur's research on the Hong Kong grouper is still in progress. Hopefully his project will yield new insights that inform future conservation efforts for this precious species. Apart from Hong Kong grouper, there are many more marine wildlife that deserve our attention. Especially here in Hong Kong, we depend a lot on our surrounding. And this is all ocean, right? <laughs> so all the pressures that we put on the marine environment, they will come back at us, basically. And uh, we will have um, less food to eat in the future. Uh, or we have to go further away to destroy other environments, unfortunately, other ecosystems. We really need to make sure that we are protecting our marine environment around us in Hong Kong to not degradate it too much so that we can keep using the resources and also enjoying its beauty in the future. So as researchers, we try our best to put these puzzle pieces together and understand how the natural world works. And this is really important for us to preserve and conserve it because we use it every day. We eat, we live in it, and uh, so we need to protect it.